Chapter 4. Rome as an Art Emporium Rome an Art Emporium. Every rich man is more or less a collector. Chrysogon, Sulla's freedman, competes with patricians. Scorus's extravagant display. The type of a crack collector, as described by Petronius Arbiter. The Roman palaces have special rooms for art gatherings. The Pinacothea, the library, the Exedra, etc., according to the rules of Vitruvius. Fashion creates new distinctions in the appreciation of art and curios. The craze for Corinthian bronze and the classification of bronze patine. The hobby of murrins and citrus tables. We do not know how many private collections there were in Rome when the collector mania finally took the city by storm. A list of Roman collectors in the fashion of the modern work, Ritz Paco, would be most interesting and enlightening. However, judging from the statues and the public buildings we know to have been replete with objects of art, we gather that as an emporium of art, Rome must have attained a magnitude unequalled in past or present times. Why this great collection of art did not transform the Romans into the most artistic people the world has ever seen is a mystery only to be solved by hypothesis. Either the Romans were innately refractory to the refinements of true art, or, like to all nouveau riches, the field of art merely afforded room for faddists, hobbyists and fashion seekers, and only as sporadic cases, a few real lovers of good art. However this may be, without discussing the causes, the effect was certainly gigantic. Art from every land found its way to Rome, which by force of circumstances thus became a monumental synthesis of art. Even at the time of Constantine, Rome counted ten basilicas, eleven forums, eleven therms, eighteen aqueducts, eight bridges, thirty-seven city gates, twenty-nine military roads leading to all parts of the known world, two arenas, eight theatres, two circuses, thirty-seven triumphal arches, five obelisks, two colossal statues, twenty-two equestrian statues, four hundred and twenty-three temples with statues of the gods, eight of these being in solid gold, and seventy-seven in ivory. It is easy to understand that the above statistics only give a faint idea of the magnificence of Rome, for the 423 streets and 1,790 private palaces noted in the same statistic as existing in Rome at the time of Constantine were in a measure respectively open-air museums and repositories of private collections of art, as no patrician mansion, according to Vitruvius, was complete without a place where paintings and objects of art could be exhibited with advantage. Cicero allows us to peep at the collections and gorgeous palaces owned by notable Romans as well as their style of living. In his Oratio, Pro Roscio Amarino, he speaks of Chrysogon in these words. Look at Chrysogon when he comes down from his fine mansion on the Palatine. He owns a charming villa where he goes to rest, just at the gates of Rome. He also owns extensive domain, all magnificent and all near the city. His palace overflows with vases of Delos and Corinthian bronze. He keeps there the famous Altepsa bought by him some time ago at such a price that on hearing the auctioneer's voice repeat the bid, the passers-by imagined a farm was being offered for sale. What shall we say of his chiselled silver, his precious stuffs, his paintings, statues, marbles? How many of such things do you think he owns? Just imagine what has been pillaged from so many opulent families in times of trouble and rapine, and all for the repletion of one single palace. When one thinks that this Chrysogon, Sulla's freedman, had the chance to amass such an accumulation of art, it is not difficult to imagine the artistic wealth that must have been acquired by Scorus, the terrible Sulla's unscrupulous son-in-law, the embezzler, the deplored and deplorable Roman aedile whom Cicero defended before the tribunal with the inconsistency of his easy eloquence.
According to Pliny, Book 36, Scaurus not only owned one of the most magnificent palaces on the Palatine, but had his mansion crowded with rare things in true Roman fashion, with a Sulla for father-in-law, a Mutella, the purchaser of prescribed citizen goods for mother, a Scaurus, the Magna Pars of the Senate, and Marius's former friend and helper in the spoliation of provinces for father, he can have had no difficulty, as Pliny informs us, in gathering the unequalled treasures that were stored in his palace. The wonders of the treasure of his art emporium are all the more easily explained, too, when we consider that he not only inherited a large fortune, but more than doubled it by speculations. To give some idea of his fatuous munificence, we may state that this Roman multi-millionaire built, for one month's performance, a theatre in the city to hold 80,000 spectators and adorns the edifice with 3,000 statues and 360 columns. Among the precious things of Scorus's collection were a great number of paintings by Porcius, works intended by the artist for his native town of Sicyon, if the Romans had had milder methods of collecting arts. Even those Romans, and they were many, who were not considered collectors in the proper sense, owned fine works of art. The Sawailius, who had large gardens on the Palatine, near the present Porta San Paolo, had what a modern connoisseur might call a few extra pieces. There was a Triptolemus, a Flora, and a Ceres by Praxiteles, a fine Vesta with two Vestals by Scopus, and an Apollo by Calamus. It may be mentioned, by the way, that it was to this famous garden Nero retired on the day preceding his death. It was here in the Servilian mansion that he was abandoned by his servants, parasites and courtiers, here that he wandered desolate and despondent before resorting to flight, on the spot formerly occupied by the Servilian gardens a mosaic was discovered, now in San Giovanni in Laterano, representing an unswept floor with the remains of a luxurious dinner. One might fancy this mosaic to have belonged to one of the Roman triclinia and their noted orgies, or, having the imagination of Ampere, the historian, to the place where Servilia had supped with her lover, Julius Caesar. History tells us that this matron, the mother of Brutus, was of the pure blood, one might use the modern expression, blue blood, of the gens Servilia. For the sake of the colour, we cannot refrain from giving the description of a true collector of art as related in all its suggestive relativity in the Satyricon, the only known fiction of Roman times, a work which, though fiction, seems close to nature and a most faithful interpretation of the artistic merits and oddities of Roman life. I entered the Pinacothea, where marvels of all kinds were gathered, there were works by Zeuxis which seemed to have triumphed over all the affronts of age, sketches by Protogenes that appeared to dispute merits with nature herself, works that I did not dare to touch but with a sort of religious fear. There were some monochromes by Apelles which moved me to holy reverence. What delicacy of touch! and what precision of drawing in the figures ah the painter of the very soul of things here on the wings of an eagle a god raising himself higher than the air there innocent hylace repulsing a lascivious naiad further on apollo cursing his murderous hands at a certain moment the owner of the collection apparently arrives he is of a type not yet extinct the man who lives for his collection, the man so engrossed in his cherished objects as to forget and neglect other pleasures in life, social obligations, etc. A white-haired old man arrived, the author of the Satyricon goes on to relate. His tormented expression seems to herald grandeur. 
his garments were of that neglected character which is often distinctly of literary people who have not been spoilt by wealth i thought of questioning him he was more of a connoisseur than myself in the epochs of the paintings and their subjects some of the latter incomprehensible to me what is the reason i asked him while we were speaking of painting for the weakening the great decadence of the fine arts nowadays more especially of painting which seems to have disappeared and to have left no trace of past glory he answered the passion for money that is the cause of the great change years ago when merit though left to starve was glorified and appreciated art flourished then only to mention sculpture lysippus was perishing of hunger at the feet of the very statue he was intent upon perfecting myron that marvellous artist who could cast in bronze the life of men and animals myron was so poor that at his death no one was to be found to accept his inheritance we of our time given over to orgies wine and women have no energy left to study the fine pieces of art under our very eyes we prefer to abuse and slander antiquity only vice nowadays finds great masters and pupils do you believe that in our day any go to the temple to pray for the health of their body before all else even before reaching the threshold of the temple the one will promise an offering to the gods if his rich relation dies and makes him his heir the other if he discovers a treasure and another if he shall achieve the dispersal of his third million in health and safety and are you surprised that painting languishes when in the eyes of every man an ingot of gold is a masterpiece that cannot be equalled by anything that apelles phidias and all the crack-brained greeks have been able to produce with the growth of fashion a collection of art became the necessary complement of a wealthy mansion the need then arose to give this collection the noblest place in the palace a room apart to enhance its importance this new view brought about a new architectural distribution of the roman patrician mansion not only on account of the family life and obligations of a wealthy class of citizens but because the well-to-do roman had obligations towards art and antiquity in the roman mansion we thus find first the atrium a large hall open to friends clients and visitors at large the peristyle is a second courtyard and is reserved for the family in the atrium the domestic gods were generally placed and records concerning the family including genealogical trees stemata with time these atria became regular museums as they were excellent places for decoration and the display of art being the open central part of the house girded by a colonnade an idea of the importance of these atria may be gathered from that of scorus's palace which had thirty-eight columns twelve and a half yards high made of the same kinds of rare marble that faced the walls egyptian green old yellow or oriental alabaster african marble and other rare kinds brought from syria and numidia scorus's atrium appears to have been hung round with tapestries embroidered with gold illustrating mythological scenes alternating with these rare tapestries were panoplii and family portraits though perhaps the favourite spot the atrium was not the only place for the artistic display of the romans their palaces also contained isai magnificent galleries used for receptions and the exedri which were rooms for conversation generally of a more sober decoration in the triclinia there were kept works in precious metals and the finest pieces of furniture there was also the sacrarium a private shrine where precious pieces of art were often hidden verus found his famous canaporos basket-bearers by polycletus the cupid of praxiteles 
and the Hercules of Myron in the Sacrarium of Hegis of Messina. There was also a room in Roman mansions set apart for the library, and some had special nooks for such collections as gems and cameos. The place where the best paintings were shown was called the Pinacothea, and was always built towards the north, so that the light from the window should be without much variation, and above all because the northern exposure left no chance for the sun's rays to enter and spoil the effect of the painting. The Roman collector of books very often went in for elegant bindings and all the showy and decorative side of a library. Seneca deplores the fact that while every elegant house in Rome contained a library, many of these collections of books were simply for show. Too many collectors, not dissimilar in this from our bibliomaniacs of today, had quantities of works they did not care to read. What is the use of having so many thousand volumes? cries Seneca. The lifetime of their owners would hardly suffice to read the titles of the works. There is a man with scarcely the literary knowledge of a serf, and he is buying volumes not to read them, but as an ornament for his dining room. There is another who is proud of his library only because it is in cedar and ivory. He has the mania of buying books that no one looks for. He is always gaping among his volumes, which he has bought solely for their titles. Lazy people who never read are likely to be found with complete collections of the works of orators or historians, books upon books. One could really forgive this mania if it had originated in a real passion for reading, but all these fine works, the great creations of divine genius, works ornamented with the portraits of their authors, do but serve to decorate the walls. Tranquillity, chapter 9. A large library was the desire of Horace. He wrote to Lelius, Do you know my daily prayer? Great gods, let me keep the little I own, less if it is your pleasure. Let me live according to my choice the days your indulgence has granted me. Let me have plenty of books, one year's income in advance that I may not be obliged to live day by day from hand to mouth. As regards the peace of my heart and my happiness, that is my affair. Satires, Book 2, Chapter 6 such contrarieties have a genuine echo in our society, where the bibliomaniac is rarely a literary man or even slightly interested in literature. Bibliomaniacs collected volumes for the most part, either because some of them were considered rare and therefore advertised the high price paid for them, or because they might serve as a decorative show. But the collecting of general art and curios, with a few exceptions, appears to have been vacuous and freakish. Even specialization, which is held to be progress in modern times, but as a matter of fact more often merely represents the triumph of erudition over art and taste, exercised in Rome the momentary tyranny of fashion. An example of this specialization is given us by the craze in Rome for Corinthian bronze. Without entering into a discussion about the legends of its origins and simply hinting that there are strong proofs that the alloy existed long before the siege of Corinth, we are safe in saying that the craze in Rome for Corinthian bronze was one of those freaks of fashion that has had, perhaps, no echo in all the after-history of collectomania. Every amateur was at that time bound to have at least one vase of the coveted metal. According to Pliny, Book 34, Chapters 1, 2 and 3, in his time this metal was equal to gold in value. In order to obtain two vases of this precious metal, Mark Antony ordered the assassination of the owner, and it must be borne in mind that Mark Antony was accused of using golden vessels for the lowest services of his household. Octavianus, supposed to be a collector of mild passions and a man who certainly did give up all such hobbies on becoming emperor, 
was also very fond of the fashionable metal corintiorum praecupitus and did not scruple to adopt the methods of sulla and mark antony to gratify his ultra fashionable taste times were then ripe for all forms of degeneration connoisseurs like those of today began to discuss patina as it required years for corinthian bronze to assume the proper patina nobilis irugo horace calls it it was natural that this alloy should have the preference over all other kinds of bronze but there were graduations of colour even in this metal and value was discriminated according to the quality of the patina of these patinae the roman collector recognised five different kinds apart from these varying degrees of merit the connoisseur pliny tells us could tell the quality of the alloy from its weight and determine the excellency of the patina by its smell another craze in rome that greatly fostered imitation and forgery was that of murrins cups of a mysterious material which was more valued than any other rare stone or rock crystal though a cup of the latter according to pliny book thirty seven easily fetched one hundred and fifty thousand cestuses an amount equivalent to one thousand two hundred pounds as a rule according to pliny for one of these cups a bigger price was paid than for a slave if the romans unlike the americans had no detectives at festivals and banquets they certainly took precautions to guarantee the safety of the treasures displayed and to guard against the possible greed of some guest whereas vero drinks from patera as a beryl remarks juvenal speaking to a parasite no one would trust you with even a simple golden cup or if perchance they do let you use one be sure a guardian near you has previously counted the precious stones studding it and follows with his eye the movement of your fingers and your sharp nails one can really not refrain from giving this gorgeous patch a roman colour as juvenal himself puts it ipse capaces he liadum crustas et inequales berilo viro tenet pialas tibi non committitor aurum well si quando data custos affixus ibidem qui numeret gemas unguesque observet acutos part five line thirty eight one may be sure that the man charged with watching was likely to do his duty with the utmost solicitude carelessness in handling those precious pieces that were used to decorate roman tables was not easily overlooked an anecdote will illustrate this vedius pollio a roman nobleman possessed one of the most esteemed collections of these crystals one day when augustus was dining at this favourite's house a slave broke one of the precious crystal cups vedius immediately ordered the slave to be thrown alive into the pond of lampreys disgusted at such an order augustus not only made a freedman of the slave but ordered that vedius's whole collection of crystals should be broken before his eyes and thrown into the pond of lampreys but as we have said above the craze for murrins surpassed the craze for the precious crystal though comparing the two we are bound to add with no artistic justification what these murrins were made of is not exactly known some of the scholars of our day believe they were artificial a mixture of clay with myrrh hence perhaps the name winkleman is inclined to think they were made of a kind of agate and marriott and decalus respectively believe them to have been mother of pearl or fluospar or porcelain in further illustration of the peculiar substance of the murrins we quote from pliny the material of the murrins is in blocks no larger than an ordinary glass and a stratum no thicker than the marble of a small console there is no real splendour in this material but instead of splendour what one might call brilliancy 
What gives the murrhines their price is the variety of their tints, the colour of the veining, either purple or pure white, sometimes shading off into nuances, reaching in some species the hue of blazing purple. The white samples shade into roseate or milky tones. Some amateurs are fond of freakish accidentalities or reflex iridescent changes like the rainbow. Others prefer opaque effects. Transparency and pale hues are considered defects, as also opaque grains inside, even if they do not alter the surface, like tumours spreading in the human body. The quality of the odour helps to set the price on the stuff. Book 37, Chapter 8 It is to be noted that while this rather vague description of Pliny's would seem on the one hand to point to the agate or any fluor spar, the addition of the odour tends to destroy this hypothesis. In any case, murrhines became the rage of the Roman collector, and the fashion being, as usual, imperative, no one was considered elegant or correct who did not own at least one sample of the precious cups. One of these cups, which, according to Pliny's estimate, could not contain more than a measure of liquid, less than half a gallon, had cost the large sum of 70 talents, 15,400 pounds. Adding that the cup had belonged to a console and that the edge of it was nibbled, Pliny remarks that such damage is the reason of the increased price. There is not in all Rome a murrhine which can boast of a more illustrious origin. Book 37, Chapter 7 This consul, who loved his cup so much as to nibble it on putting it to his lips, this collector, whose name is unknown to us, used up all his patrimony on his hobby of collecting murrhines. He possessed so many of them, Pliny adds, that one might have filled with them the private theatre that Nero had constructed in his gardens on the other bank of the Tiber. Perhaps one of the most esteemed murrhines was that which was considered the gem of Petronius's collection. He had paid 300 talents, 66,000 pounds for it. Knowing how much Nero coveted this precious cup and wishing to baffle his plans, before destroying himself, Petronius ordered his slaves to break it to pieces so that it should not fall into the hands of the man he detested. A rival craze in Rome to that of Murrhines was the passion for tables of citrus. Here, too, there is uncertainty as to the nature of this rare wood called citrus. Apparently it grew at the foot of Mount Atlas in Africa, and was in all probability a thuja. To obtain the proper grain it was felled at the root and cut into planks of a length to furnish the board of the table. Pliny seems to think that Cicero, the snob collector, set the example of extravagance in these tables. The one he bought at the fancy price of 4,000 English sovereigns was still in existence in Pliny's time and went under the name of the Ciceroniana. Cicero's price, however, was surpassed by Asinius Gallus and Sethicus, the former paying 1.1 million cestuses for his citrus table and the latter 1.4 million cestuses. Yet according to Cicero, the citrus table that Verres had placed in his triclinium was the finest and most valuable Rome had ever seen. Needless to add that in this article, too, collectors had their preferences. That there was citrus and citrus, that the precious tables were valued according to the grain of the wood and the patina. There were four qualities among the most appreciated. The tigrins the pantherins and the pavonines were those tables of which the grain and knots of the woods resembled the coats of the two animals in the case of the two first whereas the wood of the last showed knots like the eyes of a peacock's tail the fourth quality was called apiates for in these tables the wood looked like a mass of dark seeds 
or more accurately a swarm of bees, hence the name. The collector mania and thirst for display must have not only favoured the trade in spurious pieces of cheap imitation, but have caused in the chaos of tastes at times an equal confusion in general reasoning. Thus wise men and philosophers appear to have indulged in, what shall we say, rather amateurish considerations, indicating the reasoning powers of a dilettante. Cicero at one time jibes at collectors, and as another boasts of being a collector himself. Seneca, the wise Seneca, the cool-headed philosopher, was no better. Forgetting that his triclinium was adorned with five hundred fine tripod-like tables with ivory feet, he writes as a comment, I like a simple table with nothing remarkable about its grain, one that is not celebrated in the city for having belonged to a succession of lovers of fashion. And then, material considerations to which a pure soul mindful of its origins should give no weight. At one time, fashion demanded that citrus should be used in veneering, an art in which the Romans were extremely skilful, using all kinds of rare woods, ivory and tortoiseshell. Furniture veneered with tortoiseshell, especially, fetched an extremely high price and was in considerable vogue for a time. The fact was sufficient to prompt Seneca to this odd comment. Is it possible that people are so ready to pay most extravagant prices for the shell of such an unclean and lazy animal. The prices paid for art were only too often created by fashion. As shown by the artistic milieu of Rome we have been trying to outline, and yet the characters we have passed in review in our reconstruction of the past do not seem altogether dissimilar from some of our present-day lovers of art. End of chapter 4